Hello, everybody. Obviously, I'm not Damon. Damon is not here, and I've never done this. So I got notes. If I forget anything or screw anything up, please let me know. Right. Yes. <laughs> I just got started here. Caleb, okay, what's your name, kid? You did a great job, man. Thank you. And I actually am surprisingly kind of nervous. I don't know why. So, <laughs> guys be gentle. Um, basically, welcome. It's also on Rails. I'm guessing most of you guys have been here. In fact, I know most of you. If I don't know you, I'm Brid. I work here in Capital Factory for ThoughtBot. Or we office here in uh, Capital Factory for ThoughtBot. Um, now I'm going to do accounts. So I'm supposed to talk to you guys about the new member service. If you have members.houseonrails.org, you can register yourself so we're easier to find. Um, I looked on there today when I registered when Damon told me to make that announcement. And there are about 10 of us on there right now. But it does look pretty handy. Uh, so do that. Does anybody have any community announcements? I'm gonna do this shit really fast. No community announcements. Don't say shit. No, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> family friendly. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, so the bathrooms not my strong suit. So the bathrooms are out to the right, men to the left, women to the right. Um, thank you, Capital Factory. Sorry about the profanity. Um, the agenda is normal. We're gonna have one speaker, raffle, a hiring meetup, um, speaker two, and then social socialization practice. Caleb is the first speaker, next the second. Thank you guys. Um, so we've got a special raffle today. One, raffle's broken, so we gotta go old school. You'll write your name on a piece of paper that you'll find right there and put it in this cheese head. <laughs> Raff raffle will be back next month, though. I didn't have time to fix it. I mean, I, I don't know why I was like the one who got chosen to fix it, but I think it's really old. Um, but we've also got a special sponsor. They sponsored both the pizza and the happy hour. And also we've got a better raffle than usual. There's no like rail view book today. So I'm gonna let Amanda talk about that from higher. Thank you very much. Well, I'm also nervous. <laughs> yeah, nervous. I don't need this. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm also nervous. Uh, this is the first one that we've sponsored. Um, I don't know. Has anyone, has anyone heard of Hire before? Yeah. Okay, cool. Awesome. All right. I don't have to go into too much detail. But the raffle is one of our swag boxes. So anytime someone gets a job through our platform, we send you a 2K signing bonus from us as a thank you for using our platform. And this amazing swag box, drum roll, no, no. No, I know, we can't have to take away that. Um, but this is an awesome swag box and there's a bottle of champagne in here, Don P. So if you wanna get fancy, you can. Uh, and there's also some chocolate and a t-shirt and a, a mug and some other stuff here. But the, the ticker is a Don yeah. So if you um, want to celebrate, sign up for the raffle. Yeah. yeah. So no JavaScript book this month. <laughs> 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 Sorry if you wanted that. I can get you a JavaScript book. Yeah. All right. So, Caleb. Thank you. Uh, so this is going to be a talk on full text search in Postgres across multiple tables. Luckily, it's called multi-table full text search in Postgres. Some of that out. My name is Caleb Thompson. These are the places you can find me on the internet. Once you are done following me and bookmarking my website, please close your laptop and leave it closed throughout the talk. There's a lot of code in here, and you're not going to get much out of this if you're not letting it scraped. Uh, I don't like to get too much into credentials because credentials are here to get you into the room and you're here. But I do have one claim to fame, and that is that, oh no, <laughs> that I cannot run this. That my birthday is in the Simple Delegator docs. So you know I'm excellent. Things I'm going to talk to you about. We're going to look at a real life feature, something that's near and dear to my heart. I've used this in Anchor. Uh, we're going to talk about some full text search. Hopefully you can figure that out. We're going to look at views and not the Rails kind. We're looking at database views. We're going to talk about performance implications of the decisions that we've made and look at some ways to mitigate them. One of those ways is going to be materialized views, which are a Postgres specific feature, I believe. It may be in other database systems. We're going to look at two gems that are going to make our jobs a little bit easier while we're doing this, so we're not just writing raw SQL all the time. And we're going to look at some of the other options. Nick is going to be here later to defend the probably the most popular other option, which is Elasticsearch. Uh, so I will try not to touch too much on his talk. 
But I will dive into that and other options just a little bit and how they're integrated into Rails specifically. So let's search for some articles. I know this sounds a lot like the 15 minute Rails video. It's not, like I said, this is a feature that I've actually built. It's near and dear to my heart. I hate it. <laughs> this is the absolute simplest thing that could be useful to us at all when we're searching for articles. We want to find a body where the query, a body that includes a substring that is our query. That does exact substrings only, which is not super useful. Let's make it just a little bit better and use I like. This is going to give us a case insensitive match to that substring. Well, our client comes back to us after this and says, just the body isn't enough. We need to search for the title as well. So we're going to make a small change here. This still, this is starting to get a little bit complicated. Maybe it's not our, our favorite thing in the world. Uh, we're just doing an I like on two different queries here, on two different fields in the article. And we just pass query in twice because that's how this Rails helper works. Um, if this never changed again and it met our client's needs, this would be fine. We'd be happy, we'd close the book on it. But that's never the case. We now want to get results back on, based on the author's name. And we don't want to have to look at two different fields to find that. If we put in the author name, we want the articles by that author to show up, as well as the articles that mention that person's name. So what we're going to do here is we're going to join the user. Um, I'm sorry, throughout this talk, I'm going to interchangeably look at user and article, or uh, author, because consistency is hard, among other things. <laughs> so what we're doing here is we're looking at the article's body and the article's title. We're also looking at the user's name, and we're passing in this query three times now, getting out of hand. Here's another way we could do the same thing. We're gonna do uh, three different <coughs> SQL queries. We're gonna hit the database three times here to say, I want articles where the title is this, articles where the body is this, and articles where the user's name is like this query. And then we're gonna flatten and get unique results. <coughs> These results sort of suck. So what we're gonna do is look at full text search. Do you know what full text search is? No, I didn't either. Full text search is, uh, the, one of the major components is natural language search. I didn't know what that was either. What it does is it removes stop words, words that are not interesting in our results. We don't actually want any results that include words like this. Um, and so when they're in our query and when we're searching through the document, we remove those with full text search. We're going to eliminate casing because you didn't mean lowercase factory when you searched for a factory. It's the same thing that we did with like changing to item. We're going to look at synonyms again because these things mean the same thing. Stemming. Um, this is a little bit more complicated, but all of these words, try, trying, tries, and tried, are going to be recorded in the index as under a single concept, the word TRI, try. And that gives us results for any of those words when we, search, when we search for one of those, we'll see results for all of them. So looking at the same thing we just did, our SQL got a little bit bigger. Um, we don't have any of the Rails help now. So throughout this talk, what I'm going to do is show you the big picture and then zoom in and highlight the parts that we care about. So you don't have to read all of this. First thing that we're going to do is we're going to take the title and the body. We're going to combine them with Postgres and the string concatenation operator, which is this double pipe with a single space in between them so that we've got um, separate words. And we're going to alias that as the text. We don't care what the name is. We're going to do the same thing for the author name. And then we're going to select the ID from articles and the article ID out of the author's table when we do that joke. And of course, we want unique results. So querying this with full text search looks like this. It's a little bit scary. But what's happening here is we're calling 2TS vector on the text, which is for every row that we're returning, we're creating a vector, a text search vector. And then for our query, we're also turning that into something that can be used for text search. This double at sign is Postgres's um, full text search include uh, like or um, include operator matches. Thank you. That's a lot of SQL. 
Uh, so where can we put it? Well, the first option is into this for, uh, into our original query object. So we just inline all of that stuff in an execute or whatever. Second option, we can throw it into our SQL and we can use that uh, interpolation to get the query. Those both suck. Luckily, Postgres does have our answer and it's in the form of views as we discussed earlier. So a view, since Britt thinks that they're for HTML, is a partial query. It's the part of the SQL that's gonna be the same every time you run the query. Uh, and it's stored in the database as the text of the, the SQL text of the query. So instead of in a scope or a Ruby object, it gets into the database. We do have to put this into a migration, but at least then it's in, in a file that has to do with our database and not polluting a Ruby object like Ruby in your HTML or ERB template would be polluting that file. A view can be selected from, so it can be queried against. You can use a select to limit the results further and to limit the columns that are returned. A view does return a set of columns that are the result of sourcing from potentially multiple tables or even other views. You could also just return a subset of the columns from a, from a given table. And then views allow you to complete the query later on, like I said, by using a select or a where uh, operator. So we're gonna look at, this is not the same thing, but we're gonna look at a different example here, where we wanna see users who have been active within the past week. So we're gonna go ahead and create a view, users with recent activity. Uh, again, uh, unique users. We want everything off of the user because that's the, the object that we actually care about but we're gonna add in the timestamp from an activities um, as the active ad. So this is gonna be the most recent time, um, activity. So we want something that's the, where should be a limit one in there, there's not, but that's fine. Um, we want the activities that were created within the last week. So querying something like that looks just like querying a table. We can do where's and orders and selects on it whatever we want. And because it looks just like that, Active Record can treat it just like a table and use a view as its backend. We can find, so we can create a fairly vanilla model, looks like this, um, that we can interact with that view with. So it's just gonna be an Active Record subclass. We're gonna specify the table name because Active Support's uh, pluralization rules won't work for what we've built. Um, it would work with users for recent activities, but that's just not what I named this. And we're gonna set it to read only true. And we're doing that because we aren't sure at this point whether we can delete, insert, or update the records that are returned. Um, Postgres, MySQL, everybody else has very specific rules about when you're allowed to do that. In this case, you could, but if you want to actually be able to modify the changes, <coughs> modify the results of a view, make sure you look up the documentation on the views for whatever your engine is, Postgres in our case. <coughs> so is it gonna work with full text search? It's gonna be a little bit difficult. Like you saw earlier, we've got that really weird query that we had to write. And so the thing that we're gonna use that we never have to deal with that is called textacular. Um, formerly an Aaron Patterson joint, Textacular is now maintained by somebody else. Ben Hamill. Ben Hamill. Um, and it takes care of the full, ter full text search portions of your queries for you. It's going to search over, by default, every text field <laughs> on a record. So every row will get searched with a full text search. Um, it has some variant options like fuzzy search and advanced search. Basic search is the one that we're going to use. So. This would return every game that anywhere in any text column matches the word Sonic, maybe sound by accident, you never know. Um, and then this is a little bit more complicated. We're doing full text search only over specific columns. So we'll get any title that has Mario in it that runs on any Nintendo system. Let's take a look at what we did before. There's a small change here, and it's that I changed ID to be article ID in our results, and we'll see why in just one second. Our search result is really simple on the, the Rails side. 
we're just going to include this module um, and we're going to have this belongs to association which is why we wanted that article ID and what that lets us do is do a basic search across all of our articles for the word Sandy so this will return anything written by Sandy or that mentions Sandy and we're going to map that to the article that we actually wanted to see Wrapping this up to make it a little bit easier, we can include the enumerable model uh, module. If you don't know enumerable, please learn it. It's your best friend in Ruby. It's the coolest module in the standard library. Um, this object is gonna go ahead and give us basic search results for a given query. It stores those immediately. And then we um, define each, which is all enumerable it needs to do all of its magic, like map and flat map and <coughs> inject and uh, we're just going to delegate that to the results. So how would we actually do this? To create the migration, what we need to do is run an execute in the up that, should, that does the create view SQL that we wrote on a, a few slides ago. And then to roll back that migration, we need to drop that view just by name. So that's sort of not great, <coughs> but manageable. Let's see how resistant to change it is. Time for a little bit of feature creep. We now want articles whose comments match the query as well. So we're now searching on articles by title and body, authors by name, and comments by their body. So this is the full SQL now that we need. And the change is that we've unioned in one more subquery to get the article ID and the body from the comments data. So to make this change, to make our database aware of this change, we need to run another migration. We're gonna do a create or replace view searches with the SQL that we just wrote. And then to drop it, this is where it gets sort of hairy and awful, we need to do a create or replace view searches with the SQL that we wrote originally. You can't always even do that creator update because anytime you remove columns from the query that you're adding, so if you had added a new query in your um, view, a new column in your view, then you couldn't roll it back by doing the creator update. So what we need to do first is drop the view and then update it or then create it from scratch. So it's just a good habit to be in when doing this to always drop the view and then create the view with the, the searches that we need. Um, unfortunately, Rails doesn't support views when you're, dropping, when you're writing into your DB schema. And so what that means is that you, don't, you can't lo um, load the view from your DB schema file and you can't, at a glance, tell what's happening. So to get close to that, what you're going to do is, in your configuration, you need to change the database format to use structure. And then rather than writing a db schema file, you'll write a db structure.sql file, which dumps the entire database as SQL. Um, it's not super nice, and it still doesn't actually dump the views. It just gets us a little bit closer. Enter Scenic. Um, when I first gave this talk, Scenic had never been used. Now it's been used in three production applications, and we've iterated on it a little bit. What Scenic does is adds add methods to the migrations to create views. And because of that, we can dump the views as text into the DB schema file. You don't know how much you love this until you don't have it. Either. And it makes views just generally easier to work with. So Scenic lives at thoughtbot slash scenic. Um, like I said, we've used it a couple of times. If you use it and you have any problems, please let me know. I'd love to help you. It is MIT licensed, so if this destroys your business, I'm not taking responsibility for that. <laughs> So taking a look at how this is done, of course, it's too small. Uh, we're going to create a C uh, SQL file under DB views. We're going to dump the, the text of the SQL query into that file so that we get our syntax highlighting and maybe our indentation for free <coughs> from our editor. And then in the migration, we're just going to do a change instead of an up and a down. So we're going to say create view searches, just like we would say create table. Doing this, it creates um, the first version of the, the view SQL, it loads that up, and then when you roll back, it knows to drop the database. 
If you need to change it, you create another SQL file that gives you an M that has an, the next sequential number in it. So each of them are version. And we need that so that when we're rolling back and migrating forward, we can load the previous version of the view um, because there's no way to do that. There's no way to guess that otherwise. So to do that, we're going to pass the version uh, so that it knows the next version to do and the revert to version in case you can't count. This is a lot of code to write, so we did a migration. Uh, we did generators. <coughs> Scenic model creates you the model that's read only, just like we talked about. Gives you the first searches.sql file, and then it, does, it gives you the migration to load that up when you're migrating. So all you need to do after this is to write the actual SQL for your search. We also wrote a view generator, which the model generator relies on. All it does is the view file and the, the scenic view file, and then the next migration. If you've, if you've called this and you already had the initial version of the view, then it knows to increment that both in the migration and in the file. So that makes things a lot easier. Let's take a look at the performance implications of doing this. This query is really slow. It has to search across three tables to get us all of the results that we wanted. So using an explain analyze with about a thousand articles, about a hundred authors, and about ten comments per article, we end up with 400 milliseconds to do a simple query, as opposed to the I like, which was 40 milliseconds, so an order of magnitude slower. Like tables, views can be indexed. This is lucky for us. Uh, so let's go ahead and add some indices. There are several types of index. The one that you are probably already using because it's the Rails default, so any index that you add is using this, is Btree. Btree is ideal for exact matches in your database. So if you're looking for a number in an integer column or an exact string in your text or uh, bar chart columns, Btree is your name. The ones that we care about, though, are going to be GIN and GIST. GIN stands for Generalized Inverted Index, and GIST stands for Generalized Inverted Search Tree. You don't need to know those. I'm sorry for telling you. What's important is when you should use them. So let's take a look at some of the differences first. A GIN index, look, GIN index lookups are about three times faster than a GIST index lookup. However, they're also three times larger, well, they take three times longer to build initially, and they're moderately slower to update. Gen indexes are two to three times larger on disk than your gist index. You don't care about any of that, you wanna know when to use them. So you should use gen when you, when you don't have hundreds of thousands of rows in your database. You should use it when you're not concerned about longer writes blocking the database. For example, if you've already got a bunch of data in there, uh, and you don't wanna have downtime for some reason, you should use it when you're adding the index late in the game. Uh, you should use it when you don't care about this case because it's 2015, guys. And you should use it when you want fast lookups. So when your application is read heavy on this, like our articles are being written very rarely compared to how many times they're being read, we hope. Uh, and you should use just index when you have very large tables, millions of records. I left out an order of magnitude there. That's because it's up to you to figure out which index is best in, this, in, in that sort of gray area. You should use it when you have performance concerns, such as that you're seeing five second queries. Seeing five second queries, not expecting that maybe you'll see some five second queries. Don't pre-optimize this. You should use it when, for some reason, disk space is important. Perhaps it's 10 years ago. <laughs> and you should use it when your table is right heavy. So an example of this is a logging service that's storing every line in your log in that direct. And so you're seeing a lot more writes in there than reads, even if you're doing a lot of querying against that table. You're still probably seeing 10 to 100 times more reads than writes. Or writes than reads, I'm sorry. Um, these indexes are used best against something called a materialized view. 
A materialized view is a special case of view that's new in Postgres since like 9.3, maybe 9.4, that pre-populates the results of the view into a temporary table. So like I said, a view is a, a partial query. So what a materialized view does is it runs that partial query and stores all of the results into a temporary table that it controls. When you query, when you like write the select or you write the where to limit these results, it queries against that table, which is, like I said, set aside just for these queries, so you don't have to worry about read-write contention, and not getting written to as often as these other tables. So you don't have to worry about read contention as much as well. Write contention. Um, I just have to check my notes. So before we were hitting three tables, and joining and all of that other stuff. So this is a lot faster just by virtue of hitting that independent table. So the difference is, again, with the explain analyze, again, with those numbers, this is the same data. We're an order of magnitude faster even than the eye like. So 400 milliseconds for the full text search does not materialize, 40 milliseconds for the eye like, and then less than six milliseconds for the materialized view. When you have a materialized view, anytime the underlying data changes, if you want the search results to update, you also have to run this query. And this is where that 600 milliseconds comes back to bite you. That's how long it's going to take to run the partial query. That's not such a big deal because you only have to do it as often as you want your search results to update. So every time somebody publishes an article or you know, maybe the comments are made, maybe that's every 10 minutes or something. You probably don't care as much about that. So to do that, you can, make yourself, you can make your life a little bit easier by adding an after commit hook to your articles and users table, we'll say, to refresh the materialized view whenever something is committed, which is written or deleted, and then you pass in the view name to update. So what about some of those pre-built solutions we talked about? Like I said, the most common is Elasticsearch. This is the stuff that we have to put in there. It's actually a little bit less than we're seeing in our, our solution. Um, we're including two modules, which have way more content, but we don't care about that because we are including a module and we don't know how much is in there. Um, but this is going into article instead of into our view, so we're polluting one of our God objects with some of this stuff. This is the example from the readme. Solar, the sunspot, again, the example from the readme. It's got lots of crap in there. You don't want this. Sphinx with Thinking Sphinx, again, an example from the readme. This at least is in its own file, so this is a little bit better. <clears throat> so these services are great at something called faceted search. That's, this is the Amazon sidebar. Um, so there's a query somewhere off screen that we've already run, but we want to limit our results by these Boolean fields and ranges and greater than things. Um, full text search makes this a little bit more difficult. So if you're using, if, you, if your end result is for, have a search that looks like this, absolutely use Elasticsearch or whatever else. I don't like any of these services, as you may be able to tell from my tone. And the reason is that all of these have to be run in your development machine, which means that anybody that's being onboarded also has to figure out how to install them and make sure that it's all hooked up. Anytime you upgrade, anyone, anytime like somebody else is doing that upgrade, you have to figure out that that's happening and that's gonna be confusing and bad. It's got a lot of the same problems on your production machine. Uh, anytime you're deploying, you have to also update that dependency. Uh, rolling back becomes sort of painful because you have to roll back that dependency as well. You can't just push another Git version. You have to, pick, you have to change your dependencies as well. And that means that you have to be using something like Chef or whatever puppet, which means that Heroku is straight out, which sucks. Of course, all of this stuff needs to be faked in tests. You don't want your unit tests to be hitting your full text search external service. Um, we don't like them hitting our database. We certainly don't want something that's not even standard in a Rails stack. Horror story. At our project, at, our, at my job, another team was using Elasticsearch. They found that because their machines were on the same subnet, their Elasticsearch indices were getting each other's results from their fake test data, as well as 
their development results from when they were making changes in development. All of these ended up in search. Super confusing to them. They spent a week on this. Some of these, like I said, have cruft that end up in your core models. In our case, we want to, like user and article, those are going to be our god objects, which means that they're behavior magnets. They've probably got too much stuff already in them. So we want to do everything we can not to have to add more. We're removing a data concern from our database. Um, at the very least, you're duplicating the index of the data. At the worst, you're probably duplicating a lot of the data from the index column, from the index tables into your external service. That sucks. You have to learn some arcane syntax. I, I do have to go. I'm sorry, Nick. For, is Nick here? Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I spent a week actually retweeted back and forth trying to figure out some of the Elasticsearch syntax for searching. It was awful. There's no documentation on any of this. If you're, if you're trying to do something more than a fairly simple search, then you have to learn this new language that's JSON based. I mean, like, yeah, you know JSON, but you know all of this specific structure and everything else that you need to figure out. It made me go like this. <laughs> so, by combining materialized views, full text search, and some Rails magic, we have a pretty cool search feature that doesn't introduce any new dependencies. And it makes it smart. Thank you. Again, if you'd like to use Scenic, it lives here at Thoughtbot slash Scenic on GitHub. I work for a little company called Thoughtbot. Maybe you've heard of us. Um, the slides are available at kalathompson.io slash talks slash search, as well as a video. Uh, I already got over my anxiety, my social anxiety to come up here and talk to all of you, so now it's up to you guys to come and talk to me later. While you have questions, which I'm happy to answer, um, there's a discount here for any of our books, so while we don't have any of them on raffle tonight, you can at least get 50% off. If you go to thoughtbot.com slash books, you'll see a listing of all of them. Click through and then add slash Austin on Rails to get your discount. It looks like this on the bottom. Questions? When you were showing using uh, Textacular and you did the map to articles, uh, is that an n plus one query that occurs at that time? Not if you review and did a join. Okay. Or actually, you might you can do the because it's a uh, the basic search function is scope. You can do the joins there, and Rails will handle the join for you, so it doesn't have any plus one. Materialized views uh, Postgres had to regen across the entire view. Does it do a partial refresh? I had the same question. Call refresh because I'm not sure you want to do that in Africa. Then it's so. right. So it does have to run the entire view, and like I said, that's going to be that 400 millisecond cost, which could be happening in a background job. But again, like if we're talking about articles, then we're not updating that often. It's just whenever somebody publishes an article, and you can have the comments, you can have it refreshing for new comments every few minutes and be fine. Yeah. I mean, this is the big issue with whether you use a Postgres approach or a Elastic Search approach is this syncing, syncing your transactional data with your search data. And that materialized view, I mean, you say articles aren't updated that often unless you're running Facebook or you know, something. It doesn't have to be paper, right? I didn't go that far. Anyway, <laughs> 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 like, you've got like, data constantly coming in that you want to be able to search on, then you know you need to run that refresh all the time. You need to update your last search all the time. That's in my experience that that has always been really painful. Yes, search is hard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> a solution that you can use, like I said, the B tree and the gen indexes. I said they can be used in your You can also have them on your your host tables. So for the columns that you're doing the queries on, uh, you can index those and speed up the, the just the plain view query. 
Um, the results I saw were that it went down about 25% to like 100 milliseconds, still not great, but faster. And adding new tables, so if you're searching like we are here across multiple tables, those joins add a lot of time. And worked out a way to get two rounds of applause there. Very, very cool. So now we take the break, but I think it's also time to do the hiring hire thing. I don't know, Damon told me to ask people to raise their hands too. So who's looking to hire people? Um, all right, we got a few people. And are people who's looking for jobs? All right, so now you guys are all supposed to come up here and interact with each other. Um, and then also the raffle. Don't forget, we don't have raffler today, and it's a better prize than usual. So some, just write your name on this and put it in that cheese head. Should we pass it around? Sure. <laughs> uh, I'll let you guys figure that out somehow. If you want the champagne, put your name in that thing. And then at the end, Amanda will draw a name. It's kind of sore. So I want you actually draw it. So everybody ready? <laughs> Mix those up. Yeah, I was good right now. Yeah, Mine was on the bottom, so mix them well. Okay, I'm looking for the bottom. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, no, the top. Okay. It's a folded one. Oh. Everybody's waiting with bated breath. Annie! Annie! Hey. <laughs> relocation bonus uh, for companies that, I don't know if anyone here is a hiring manager, but if you're looking for talent from other areas of the country, um, we'll help cover that relocation cost. Cool, so yeah, like I said, Nick asked for as much time as we can give him, and that turned out to be two minutes, Nick, so. Yeah, let's do this. I don't know if you want that. All right, hi everyone. Okay, so I was a little hesitant to get give this talk. I was uh, signed up for a completely different talk for uh, for this group, one that I had already given before, which is always a slam dunk. So uh, if I run out of content, maybe we'll just switch over to talking about Juggle, you know, <laughs> or uh, you know, extended Q and A is always appropriate too. Maybe that we have more talking today than just slides, but um, yeah. That said. We're gonna talk about Elasticsearch, and I'm gonna go through two things. Oh, scratch that, one thing, didn't finish my slides. Uh, we're gonna talk about a basic user search that you can add to a Rails site. I like the example of user searching because not every app needs you know, product level, customer facing search. Um, but I'm sure everyone has spent time digging around through a console, trying to look stuff up. And um, I really like having full text search just to speed that up. I have a real simple admin page on most of my apps with a real simple search field on it. And it just saves a lot of time and energy. And uh, really, that's, this is my gateway drug to getting you into Elasticsearch, because we'll talk about plenty of other stuff um, after that. So yeah. So <clears throat> yesterday, I went through and I started on a little demo app. Uh, this is up on GitHub, and I can give you the URL later. Um, but this is just going to be real straightforward. We're creating a user resource. We've got a couple of columns. You know, I just want you guys to track with me on, on kind of the data that I'm working with. We've got a simple uh, name field, an email field, a password digest. 
Uh, we want to load up our demo app with some data, so I'm going to enable bcrypt for my passwords. I'm going to pull in the faker gem for a bunch of fake names and email addresses. And um, in my database seeds file, I'm just going to generate a thousand random users. So this is going to give us something to search against. Let's go ahead and populate the database. And um, a little bit of HTML later, we've got a table full of users. And um, yeah, I mean, so if you're like me, you've got, you know, this is maybe more than you have on some of your administrative backends. Um, but it would be nice to go through and be able to find specific people, look up their account, make, um, you know, search based on their name, search based on their email, uh, maybe search based on the names or emails of associated, um, other associated objects, projects, organizations, that sort of thing. So um, let's keep moving forward then. We'll um, build a basic search action. And a uh, real simple route here, again, this is, this is trying to give you the, the kind of most minimal possible example to adding search to an app. Uh, we've got a search route. And it's just going to reuse our users controller uh, index action. Very easy form tag or form uh, here. We're uh, using that search path. We're sending our requests with the get method. And we've got a search field. <clears throat> so back to our um, interface here. We've got our search field up there on the top. Um, but it's not really wired up to do anything quite yet. Um, so in our controller, I'm looking for the param, the, the Q param, and um, you know this is the, this is the spot where you could say, hey, let's run that SQL-like query, um, which by the way, a little bit later I'm going to talk about why SQL-like is awful. Um, but yeah, we feel like we want to do something a little better. This is where we're going to start thinking about making this searchable. So. Tool of choice here tonight is Elasticsearch. Uh, I use a Mac, so I've got Homebrew. It's open source, super easy to install. I mean, I installed Postgres with Homebrew. Elasticsearch is also available on Homebrew. Um, there are two gems that we're going to use in our gem file, um, the Elasticsearch model gem and the Elasticsearch Rails gem. Elasticsearch model has a bunch of Active record, uh, active model based um, hooks into your model. Uh, instance methods to serialize your objects into JSON, a lot of helper methods for uh, running search requests and actually communicating with the with Elasticsearch on its protocol. Um, the Elasticsearch client is actually one of the better open source clients out there. Um, I actually did a little bit of headbutting with, with one of the maintainers in the uh, early days before it became an official client. Um, it used to be based on Sunspot, which I've had some dealings with as well in the past, and which is starting to show its age. Uh, but these days, Elasticsearch Rails and Ruby client is actually really nice. Documentation's really good, and I think a lot of it's kind of auto-generated from documentation, but suffice to say, it's handy. So let's add it to our user model. This is what we've started with. Uh, just for basic user creation. And really, it's as simple as including this module. Um, like Caleb says, there's a lot going on under the hood in that module, and you'd definitely be um, advised to read the documentation and kind of take a skim through the code. Um, but mostly what it is, it's, it's kind of a proxy onto um, its own whole set of classes and classes and methods. So. It, while there is a lot going on under the hood, it does uh, make it pretty easy for you to uh, intercept what it's doing, to kind of control its behavior and, and limit its behavior and, um, and do what you need to do. Um, another module it's got is um, this callbacks module. This is uh, adding after save, after update, after destroy hooks, um, so that when your objects go through their normal life cycle, it will send off updates to your Elasticsearch index to keep it in sync. Uh, and this works pretty well for a lot of use cases. Um, it's a little bit naive in the sense that it is, you know, are now potentially sending requests across HTTP, out across the network. 
maybe even during the hot path of when your users are adding or deleting or updating your records. So um, there are definitely workloads where you wouldn't necessarily want to use this particular uh, callbacks module, but you'd want to say define your own after update hooks that instead of directly making the update to your index, you would stick that update into a queue somewhere. Um, incidentally, this is where some of the popular Rails background job processors originally came from. So delayed job, one of the first really popular background job processors. If you look at its documentation, it says right there that one of its main original use cases was sending updates to their solar index. Um, so this is a really common practice, and um, also when you kind of get to a high scale, it's really good to, to queue those updates um, so that you have some buffering and, and you're going to have different performance characteristics uh, to think about there, which, go ahead and table that for later. Um, so continuing to kind of set up our application to get our data indexed, um, the Elasticsearch Rails gem includes some rake tasks, and we're just going to set up a real quick um, tasks file to um, require that. Uh, pretty straightforward stuff. And these are the two tasks that we get. Um, so if we search for tasks named with Elastic, we can see we get an import all and an import model. So import all is going to look for all the models that you have, which include the Elasticsearch model module. Um, same thing, import model does the same, but with one model at a time. And um, it takes these models and it iterates through um, all or some of your records and um, sends them off to Elasticsearch to be indexed. So we're just going to go ahead and run rake Elasticsearch import all. You know, a second or two later, we'll get this telling us that it has done what we asked it to do. I always like to do a little quick check of Elasticsearch itself. This is a little sneak peek of what it's like to interact with Elasticsearch as well. Uh, Elasticsearch is all a RESTful JSON API, so we can do we can do anything we want interacting with it uh, with just curl. Curl has become one of my most used tools of all time now. And so in this case, I just counted the number of documents in this particular index, the user's index. Uh, and it's telling me that there's a thousand documents in there. Great, because we had a thousand users. So it looks good here. So rewinding a bit back to our user's controller, this is what we had before. This is kind of the, uh, the no-op version of the controller. So what we want to do is we want to replace that, um, that first conditional there when the params uh, when the queue param is, is present, we want to do something with that. We want to actually search something. So um, this is the easiest possible way to integrate Elasticsearch. I mean, one of the nice things here, we've got this search method on the class that is given to us by the um, Elasticsearch model gem. And it has a, a kind of a default use case where if you give it a string, it uses that string as a query. And uh, it's just going to try and match against any of the fields on your user object in that index. And uh, the object that it returns is a search object, like a search response object. It encapsulates more than just the matching documents. It's got some metadata like, um, oh, the number of results that matched, the amount of time the search took to run. If you're doing pagination, it's got you know, like your page. Uh, if you're doing other fancier search options like uh, faceting, with the faceted browsing, you'll have different faceting information on that search object. Um, but that search object has a records method, and so that's going to take all its hits and find the active record <coughs> objects for you so that you end up with the same you know, uh, users in your users instance variable. So practically speaking, that means if, we're, uh, if we've got our users instance variable with an array of users, we don't really have to change anything in our, in our uh, interface, and it'll just work. So going back to our users interface, I searched for a name that was present in the index, and there we go. Found that. Um, in practice, these searches are going to be incredibly fast. Um, we'll touch on that a little bit later, um, because <coughs> 
what we should think about now is, say, looking at this this results, maybe maybe I uh, want to look for Vince's colleagues. Maybe there are other people with email addresses at wolf.biz. So I'm going to search for Wolf next and see what comes up. It's not quite what I was expecting. So we matched someone else with the last name of Wolf. We didn't actually match Vince based on his email address. And this gets into uh, a larger subject of uh, term analysis. So really, a lot of the magic that's happening with any, any index, any index in your database, the point of having an index is you do some amount of work up front to generate this index. So that it's now in a structure for when you want to find some data, you can use that index to find that data much more quickly. So it's, it's pre-computation. You do work in advance to make your searches much more uh, performant later on. And so what Elasticsearch does, um, a major part of what Elasticsearch does is it does analysis on your, uh, on your values, on your text. And um, we'll dig into that a little bit um, more in detail, but something we do can do here to kind of modify in our Rails app what's happening. Uh, this is something that I've just added to the user class um, where we're going to say, hey, Elasticsearch, let's use um, let's use this as our default. Uh, for our default analyzer, let's use this tokenizer. I'm going to break down what a tokenizer is in a little bit and what analysis does in a little bit. Um, but we're just kind of modifying the default behavior of how Elasticsearch analyzes uh, your data. Um, so some reason, a reason we're kind of pulling out this hash here first and assigning it to a variable is because um, when you, uh, because Elasticsearch, the Elasticsearch client does do stuff inside of your model. Um, Caleb pointed this out, is it tends to get kind of messy. Your, these models tend to be sort of god, god models anyways, and you end up adding a lot of lines of code. So I'm going to do a couple quick refactors here to make sure that this kind of stays a little bit saner. So this starts to expand out because Elasticsearch model has this settings method, which gives you a really nice uh, DSL to define like how the index is configured, how it behaves, um, what fields you have, how these fields are all supposed to be analyzed. So in this example, again, I'm just trying to change our default analysis to be a little fuzzier, a little more loose. And so I've changed the default to tokenizer uh, from, the, from the standard tokenizer down to a lowercase tokenizer, which is going to be a little more permissive on how it splits up its terms. Um, you know, eventually you're going to maybe want to pull that hash into a separate YAML file. I like to stick these things in config Elasticsearch and um, kind of help dry things up there. Um, these are settings that are all going to apply the first creation time of the index, so it makes sense to put these in a config file. Um, but again, kind of breezing forward, we'll get back into Elasticsearch's analysis stuff in more detail later. We're just trying to show you what this all looks like from a practical standpoint. So whenever you're making changes to your analysis settings and how Elasticsearch builds the index, we're going to need to rebuild that index. This is um, true for any time you're building indexes. If you change how they're generated, you're going to have to go scrap them and, and rebuild them. So. Uh, during development, this rake task is definitely going to become your friend. Um, we added a parameter on this, this uh, force environment variable on the end, to tell the uh, rake task to actually delete the index that, that exists and to recreate it, because some of these settings only take effect at index creation time. A bit of a long um, digression here, but the end result is when we run our search again for wolf, now we're matching on both the, uh, the last name there, Nicole Wolf, and we're matching on wolf.biz because now all of these email addresses are getting split up into a lot more discrete um, tokens. So this, this was kind of my crash course tour through like uh, zero to fuzzy full text search in apparently a, wait, no, that's the time, <laughs> you don't know. Um, in just a few minutes. And so I want to dig in just a little bit more on what exactly is happening when we talk about analysis and what it means to have an index and why that's important. Uh, and then 
based on some reactions from earlier tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about what it means to have a JSON-based query uh, DSL. And so um, we'll kind of build up an example, Elasticsearch query, and talk about the components of that. So back to kind of the, the full view of our table here. Um, we created 1,000 users, so we've got 1,000 rows here. You know, this could easily be 5,000, 10,000, hundreds of thousands. And when you're using a query like SQL-like, effectively what you're doing is you're starting at the top and you're looking at every single record all the way down through your entire database. And if you want to have two different clauses, so you want to like take two terms and split them and run a like query for each term and then join the results, well now you're searching through your entire database twice three times, four times, and uh, this definitely does not scale. It's, doesn't, it's not to say people don't do it, um, but it's <laughs> not this. And um, that's, we can do it. So uh, let's talk about analysis real quick. Analysis is two things. Uh, it is tokenizing. So it's taking a big blob of something and it's turning it into individual tokens. So our, our example here, we're using names. Here's a random name from that list. Uh, we're taking this string, string of characters. These are just binary ones and zeros, remember. And we're turning it into tokens that have some semantic value to the system. So in this case, we have two tokens. We have the first name Mac, last name Douglas. We're just splitting on white space in this example. And uh, Elasticsearch, um, has so many different tokenizers. I mean, I don't know about so many, it's got half a dozen, a dozen maybe. Um, there is splitting on white space, there's splitting on non-word characters, there's splitting on character case changes, there's splitting on, oh gosh, there's generating different types of tokens, whether that's a text type or an email type or a URL type. There is morphological analysis where languages that don't use white space like Chinese or Japanese, it'll use a dictionary to know this sequence of characters is a word. Next word, right? Um, tokenization is, is a very subtle subject and um, Elasticsearch is built on another library that handles a lot of this, or all of this, uh, called Lucene. Uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's a, it's a great library. It's, been, it was open sourced in 2000, 2001, so it's about 15 years old. And Lucene is the real workhorse of what's going on under the hood. It is 15 years of specialized, purpose-built, open source development just focusing on search. So there's a lot of great stuff in there. Uh, so like I said, to um, analysis is two things. Tokenization, take a big blob of text, split it into discrete terms. Uh, it's also um, filtering. So you run through, you run each of those output terms through a chain of filters. And filters do things to individual terms. Uh, one really popular one is going to be the lowercasing filter. Um, by default, Elasticsearch is set up with an, an analyzer that splits on white space, um, splits on white space, and then lowercases the, out, the, uh, the terms that come out of that. Um, and again, this is because, at least in English, you're going to expect that capitalization doesn't really matter. Um, filtering, again, gets very subtle. Um, another really popular um, filter is an n-gram filter, where we're taking our terms and we're breaking them down into discrete substrings, discrete n-grams of the terms. And this is great for like a type ahead find or auto-completing type of search. Um, where you know every keystroke the user makes, you're getting actual matches in the database and matches that correspond to objects in the database. So um, I see a lot of this kind of search and um, anyway, yeah, filtering. There are dozens of different ways to filter. There are, you can replace terms based on a synonyms list, um, say for, names, you know, people's names, for example, come in a lot of different forms that you can replace and normalize with synonyms. Uh, you can normalize uh, linguistic stemming, get to the same parts of speech. Uh, you can um, 
normalize phonetic sounds of like the morphemes of the word. So you can make matches in the terms on your index based on someone having typed something that sort of sounds like something that's in your index. Uh, there's just so many different interesting ways. And the nice thing about Elasticsearch is all this stuff can be defined in a way that's combinatorial. So you're really like plugging and playing and depending on which analyzers you're using and which you're plugging into in which order, you can come up with some really sophisticated uh, ways to match uh, match user searches. So um, at the end of all this, we're ended. We're resulting with a big list of terms. You know, this is just an example of the names that I used. A very simple, you know, lowercase analysis here. And um, this is called a dictionary. Um, what, we're, what we're working on building here is called an inverted index, and it starts with a big list of terms like this. Now, an indexing index is not a new concept. I like to say that indexing is as old as books. Because if you want to find the pages in a book with some idea or term that you care about, you could start on page one and just read the whole book and just kind of bookmark it as you go. That's your SQL-like search. Or you could turn to the back of the book and go to the glossary or the index. Really nice, convenient. If you haven't used it, you should try it. If you, <laughs> if you still use books, I don't know. Um, and it's, it's great. It's an alphabetically sorted list. So you go to the letter you want. You kind of let your eyes wander around in there. It looks something like this. And this is what we're building with, with something like Lucene. Um, really simple. It's totally flat. Uh, incidentally, this is one of the advantages of using Lucene over more general purpose database uh, indexes. I actually don't really know what the structure of Postgres's indexes for full text. Uh, I know that most of the indexes you use kind of day to day, hey, you know, add like add an index to this column. Uh, it's going to be a balanced tree, a B tree. Um, I think. Postgres might have, maybe Caleb knows, I don't know. We can we talk about this a little bit, but the gin <laughs> index that I recommended is this. Is, is this, it's segmented? It's this exact. Okay, so the nice thing about this kind of index is we have this list of terms on the left. It is alphabetically sorted, and practically speaking, that means we can, instead of having to search the entire database, we just search really quickly and easily. We do a binary search through our sorted list of terms. So now instead of a search that's running in linear time with respect to the entire contents of your database, we're running a search that's logarithmic time, which is exponentially faster than, than linear. Uh, logarithmic time with respect to the size of your terms, which is usually gonna be a lot, lot smaller. Just the terms, the size of the terms themselves is gonna be a lot smaller than the actual full contents of your database. So put together, this means that we just have an incredibly fast structure for looking up, this is the term that I care about, and though there are the documents that have the term that I care about. And so a Lucene, Lucene index has a lot more data than this in its index. Um, and again, we're talking like 15 years of open source development that went into building these indexes. So it's crazy optimized um, on the systems side. Um, for the purposes of being really fast for both building the index and searching the index. So um, yeah, so I'm kind of getting close to the end of my slides. I wanted to jump into a little bit of um, what an API, what the API for Elasticsearch looks like. Because it is definitely something different. It's not SQL. Some people like that, some people don't. Um, you know, I can go either way. Um, fortunately, they at least made a, like a decent choice. If they're not going to do SQL, at least they went for RESTful JSON. Uh, something we're all pretty familiar with, I'm sure, because you can't build a Rails rail app these days practically without building a RESTful JSON API. I mean, maybe you can, but in practice, I don't. Uh, so when we're inserting data into Elasticsearch, pretty much this looks like this. We're making a post request to some resource. 
uh, the URL there being, uh, or the path there being uh, the name of the index, the type of document in that index, and then the ID of that document. <clears throat> so we're posting just plain JSON in a lot of cases. And if we want, we can get that same document out with a get request. We can delete it with a delete request. We can update it. Um, all this normal, you know, RESTful CRUD stuff. Um, it should be really familiar to a lot of us as rules developers. So that's kind of the uh, indexing side. Um, talking about searches, searches are interesting in Elasticsearch. And apparently the mic's weird. Searching is interesting in Elasticsearch. It took me a while to wrap my head around this too, because yes, there's, there's actually a lot of documentation on searching, but it's either like buried or incredibly specific. There's not a lot of context out there. And so this is all still fairly new technology as well. So um, anyway, so hopefully this will kind of help um, give some more context to what's happening. So this is a really simple search request. Um, we make a request to this um, sort of underscored path name, this underscored action on a resource, <laughs> uh, underscore search in this case. Um, we could post to that as well, no big deal. Um, and we have this JSON document. And what this JSON document is doing is it's describing a search request. And I really like to think about this in terms of like an object-oriented design. So like a search request in Elasticsearch is an object. Um, it has certain attributes, properties. One of these top-level attributes is the query. Query is kind of a distinct object from a uh, distinct concept from the search. The search might include things like how it's being sorted, or what page you want, or how many documents you want. Um, but then we can also drill in and say, here's the actual query that I want you to run to match documents that should be included in this search. Queries now, again, object oriented. There is a query object, or a, a whole bunch of query types that Elasticsearch defines. One of the query types is a match query. Um, there are, there is a term query. There are uh, geo search based queries. There are, um, I don't know, there's a dozen different kinds of queries. All of them have their own, um, you know, properties, attributes. And again, all this stuff is kind of composable. So a very simple example here, we are sending a match query. We're telling match to search for the term wolf in all fields. And not just a term, this is a phrase. And so this is one of the like, kind of highest level conceptual queries, the match query. It actually does a lot of work under the hood to kind of parse out what exactly this means. Which fields are you trying to match against? What terms are present in the query, uh, the query string that you're supplying? Um, but when I ran my earlier search, I'm pretty sure this is a search that got run. Um, very loose, very fuzzy, we're trying to match against all fields. This search is a little more sophisticated. Um, so we have a query. The query in here is a filtered query. So it is a query which has two attributes, the filter and the query. And uh, the nice thing about a filtered query is it'll run this filter, which sort of limits the documents that you're looking at. And then runs the query itself, uh, again, our match query, against just those documents. Um, this is my favorite query in Elasticsearch. It's just incredibly useful. Um, Elasticsearch has really, really cheap, um, so I'm using a range filter here. And so effectively, this range filter is saying, give us a range for everything that's created at, or should be created on, just created. Everything created at, excuse me, where created at is greater than or equal to this sort of time string, this sort of time format string. And we're using now minus 30 days, uh, rounded off to the nearest day for technical reasons. Um, basically we're saying, hey, limit the search to anything created at, you know, created within the last 30 days. And then within that set of documents, then match this particular term. So these, um, these filters are, again, are like where the faceted browsing idea comes in when you have that sidebar of here's all the different facets that you could search on, the sort of 
size, the color, the shape, the model, I don't know. Um, those all end up turning into queries so that you can really focus in on the, uh, on the data that you're trying to search. Um, this, this gets to be really powerful stuff. And again, like we have this DSL here, which you know, takes a little bit of getting used to, but um, it's combinatorial. There's, there's a lot of different nesting. There's a lot of different kinds of filters, a lot of different kinds of queries. It's very composable, very flexible. So you can build these really powerful queries that give really sophisticated results. And it's all, you know, incredibly fast. Um, you know, one of the bragging points that we've seen is it has very, very fast range filters, for example. So when you want to match against a range of numbers, a range of dates, uh, it is optimized for that use case. Um, so yeah, um, that's actually my last real slide. Like I said, I kind of did all this talk last second. So I mean, if we want to talk about Jekyll, that's cool. Or I'm happy to, uh, I don't know how much time we have anyways, happy to do some Q&A. Or... Yeah, so we're like way ahead of schedule, I think, also partially because of my breakneck speed intro. So if you want to chill out and take some questions or sure, yeah. talk about really anything you want. I thought this was going to be a duel, aren't you guys going <laughs> to? <laughs> someone bring the fencing foils? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is Texas, it's pistols. Or yes, right. exactly. I don't think, do, do you know where the Tugger is able to make use of uh, proximity? Proximity is a great one. Uh, so proximity ends up in your index. So one of the things, I showed the term and then I showed like the IDs. One of the things that's also um, inserting into the index there is like the, it's not just it's not just document IDs here, it's the field, it's the ID, it's the ID of the document, it's the field, and it's the position within the field. And uh, these are called term vectors in Lucene. And so for every uh, term, you get this list of field position ID. And so proximity is useful when you're doing your querying because if you want, say, a phrase query, uh, you know, if you're in Google and you put something in quotes, you get like that exact phrase with one term next to the other. Uh, and that's because when you have position information of where those terms are present in your field, it can say like, find this term, find that term. Now find all the occurrences where the position is within some number of terms of each other. So a little bit of math happening under the hood. Um, and that's a whole different thing too. When you're doing these kinds of fuzzy searches, you can say, I want, I want terms that are matching within two or 10 <coughs> positions of each other. Two kinds of users that are represented by two different classes in Ruby or different document types. Can I search across those with a single search? Or yes. Uh, you were limited by your client uh, more so than, than Solar. And um, <clears throat> so the question was if I have objects in different kinds of models, different kinds of classes, can we run a search that matches you know, more, than, more than just the one? Uh, definitely yes. Um, Solar, actually, Solar is very similar to Elasticsearch. They both share Lucene. They're an, an HTTP API for working with Lucene. Um, I didn't really introduce myself at the beginning. My name's Nick. I run uh, Solar Hosting as a service. I run Elasticsearch Hosting as a service. I've been doing search engine stuff for like six years now. Um, kind of a funny niche to find yourself in when you are just kind of a random general purpose Rails developer, but it's been fun. Um, so yeah, Solar, Elasticsearch, Lucene, they don't really have a concept of a type. Uh, there's very, very little structure beyond the actual index structure of terms, term vectors, position ID, all that kind of stuff. There's no types, there's no tables, there's no classes or anything. It's a flat data model. You have an index, the index has documents, the documents have fields. There's no associations, there's no joins, there's no any of that stuff. Elasticsearch tries to fake a little bit of that, but it's all fakery under the hood. So when you're inserting documents into an index, when you want to, you have to tell the index that this document has a certain type. 
by giving it a type field. So if you're using Sunspot with Solar, Sunspot indexes both a type and a class name on one field with the name of the class that it's coming from. Um, likewise with Elasticsearch, we had the uh, URL here. Uh, this first one is an index. The index is, is the Lucene index somewhere. This is like a directory full of files. Um, the, second, the second part of the path there, user, is the type of the document. And this is, this is just a column on the document that says this type is, is user. So it's kind, of a, it's kind of a special hidden value within the JSON that gets sent to Elasticsearch. It's, it actually uses underscore type is user in that case. So when you're searching across different models, if they're in the same index, Again, you, you, have to act, you have to actively narrow in and restrict your searches in order to only search a specific type. Because by default, you're just searching all these documents that are unstructured. <coughs> so that comes down to kind of the client size of Sunspot and the Elasticsearch model. Um, if you're using like a search method on a class, it's assuming you only want to look at that specific class. And so it, in, it, so it limits that search um, to just objects with that type on it. Um, but it's absolutely possible to search all the documents in an index. It is also certainly possible to search across multiple indexes. Elasticsearch actually makes that really easy to do. So you have to do a little bit more work for that. So yeah, guys, this is like free search consulting right now. So I take advantage. Yeah. So back in your controller, when you were looking at the search results, yes, and you're getting the, uh, the records, is that a relation or is that just an array of records? So what it's getting back is, um, that's a good question, I don't actually know. Should we do some live counting and figure it out? Let's do it. Let's figure it out. I just noticed you were ordering like the default no search. Yeah. And you weren't ordering the, uh, the others. For in for no specific reasons really, just kind of. Okay, let me, let me set you guys up with some mirroring. We'll find, we'll learn some things together. One of the things I would do with Sunspot in that case, uh, Sunspot will give you a um, Sunspot will give you a. Uh, sorry, I can't talk and use my brain at the same time. So I don't know what that says for the rest of the talk. <laughs> um, was I saying something about Sunspot? I don't remember. I'll come back to this question in just a second. <coughs> Did it all explode? No. Okay, so I have a console here. Let's get a reasonable font size. Okay. <laughs> I do a lapel mic thing here. Okay, um, oh, oh, hey, thank you. Okay, so we are doing a search, user.search. Okay, we got an error, sweet. Um, hello. Okay, so, right. Um, so in this particular client, let me get what I'm looking for here. Okay, so we're actually gonna get this. Thanks. Okay, so what we're this is this is what we've returned. Um, right. So we're looking at IRB. This is what I ran. User got search. I gave it a term. I'm calling this records method. In this particular case, the Elasticsearch model it it models as much as it can. Uh, it has this response model, but then it also has this records. Um, which is some sort of proxy object, which is going to satisfy a lot of the interfaces that you might expect from. I don't think it is a proper ARL type. Yeah. Like if we call a where maybe, or if we just do the, the sorting again. Yeah. So if we order by uh, created at, created at, Oh, hey, it worked cool. So I think maybe it does actually do an ARL under the hood. <laughs> Sweet. Um, 
Um, all right, when I was doing this in Sunspot, I would actually make a search method on a class. It has a method called like result IDs or something like that. And so you could do like a where IDs in search.resultIDs, um, which is probably similar to what's happening in another thing here. Good question. More questions? Oh, you were first. Um, how much have you gotten into kind of the operations or architecture, like clustering and sharding and replication? More than I would like. Yes, <laughs> much, much more than I would. Uh, what have you learned that you can share with us? Uh, no such thing as one size fits all. <gasps> there is a one size that fits many. Um, so when we're talking about the operations and the architecture of Elasticsearch. Um, I go through the same process. I mean, so there's there's no one end result, but there is a similar process that you can kind of go through no matter what your use case is. And uh, when you're designing Elasticsearch, you're thinking about scalability. Um, one of the things you have to think about is, so what is this index? An index is a directory full, it's a Lucene class, it's a directory full of files. Um, Elasticsearch breaks up an index into what it calls shards. Um, and shards are just different actual, it's kind of a logical, uh, the shard is the actual Lucene index. They list, the index is a, like this logical collection of shards. And um, so you have different kinds of shards. Primary shards where you just kind of, if you have two primary shards on your index, you're just taking your data, you're cutting it in half. Half goes on this computer, half goes on that computer. So this that's the, kind of the first thing you have to think of when you're designing like the operations side of Elasticsearch. And so primary shards are great because um, when we're dealing with building indexing, again, this is pre-computation. We're doing work in advance. When we have new data, when data changes, we're gonna spend a lot of CPU time to shoehorn it into some structure that's way faster down the road for our searches. So in practice, that means most of your scaling burden when you're talking about the operation side of Elasticsearch is all in indexing. This is just piles and piles and piles of string parsing. Um, it's lots of CPU, it's lots of garbage being generated in memory. Um, so, you know, start with a single shard because it's a good way to get a baseline of your performance. Uh, if you need to handle updates, if you need to handle a larger volume of updates and you'll notice that, you know, doing your indexing, it'll slow down, it'll like pause for an unreasonably long time or it'll time out entirely when you're trying to update the index, it'll just go slower than you would like, things like that, then that's when you start to add primary shards. You know, grow that to, generally speaking, you're gonna want like a primary shard per CPU core, for example, in your cluster. Um, or some reasonable greatest common denominator of, or you know, least common multiple of the number of cores in the cluster. So if you have like three nodes on EC2 with four cores each, Maybe a 12 primary shard index is, well, it's gonna be awesome. Like most of, I will tell you that most of my customers, if you're under a million documents, a one primary shard is gonna be fine. If you're millions of documents, then that's when you start to kind of grow that out a little bit. Other considerations, uh, replication. Elasticsearch makes heavy use of replication, so it's kind of taking that index and making, or taking that shard and making a full copy of it on another system. Um, Elasticsearch is definitely designed in a different era, Lucene as well, is designed in a different era than like a general purpose data store. Um, it's designed to be secondary. It's not a primary database. It assumes that your data is stored safely somewhere else. So like where Postgres has something like it's right ahead log and it is just bomb proof when it comes to the guarantees it makes about the consistency and uh, resiliency of your data. Lucene and Elasticsearch don't really make those similar kinds of guarantees. It's more about the performance side of things, more about build the index, search the index. If you lose some records, you know, you'll just have to go re-index them. Um, so replication is incredibly important in that paradigm because um, on day-to-day -day sort of operations, if you have a couple of replicas, when you make an update, Elasticsearch is going to send that update and then to more than one shard, to more than one kind of replica shard, and uh, wait for an acknowledgement from, and this is configurable stuff, but I think by default it waits for a forum, so it waits for some 
greater than 50% of those shards to acknowledge like, yep, I got that. So that's another important consideration when you're doing Elasticsearch in, in production. Some reasonable number of primary shards just to accommodate the volume of indexing and some reasonable number of replicas to make sure that if something crashes and burns, you can replace it. So. Aside, aside from configuring uh, replicas so that you have a quorum before it says, yep, yeah, I got it, uh, durability is a challenge with Elasticsearch you spoke to. Are there any other configurations or techniques that you can suggest or recommend to help uh, optimize for durability? Yeah, so the question being, because durability is kind of a challenge in the Elasticsearch role, uh, <laughs> absolutely true. What are some other techniques you can use to work around that, to optimize for that? Um, you know, the first one is keep your data somewhere else, <laughs> um, and and be, you know, practice your re-indexing, practice your bulk data importing. That's really helpful. I mean, when you're at a very large scale, so I'm sure there's a whole range of scales here in the room here. But when you're at a very large scale, I mean, maybe you have all of your data in Hadoop and you're running a gigantic MapReduce job and you're shoveling data into a queue, and then the queue is then inserting into data, or like inserting into Elasticsearch, which incidentally is my answer to how do you make things more resilient, is putting a queue in front of Elasticsearch, super helpful. Um, a lot of the times when you're trying to index a lot of data, you want a lot of parallel workers to fetch data out of your database really quickly, uh, because that's one of the main bottlenecks there, is you're just your IO performance of getting out of the database, the kind of CPU time to serialize the data, um, and you really want to parallelize that load. On the other hand, the Elasticsearch side, it hates parallelization when you're doing updates, because uh, a lot of stuff happens with Java that, um, you know, it's only going to have like a single thread in Elasticsearch handling indexing, or a single thread per shard per core, I think is what it is. And if you try and really parallelize, you're going to generate tons of garbage and you're just going to crash your server. So. You have like some number of highly parallelized worker pulling out of your database, but then you only want like one worker per shard or something inserting into Elasticsearch. And so to kind of match up the difference in between the two, it's really helpful to buffer all of your updates into a queue. So I've heard of people using Redis for that. You know, if you're using like Sidekick or something, um, you can kind of make Redis do double duty as your buffer. Um, so you might, in your after save hooks, insert IDs or something like that into a Redis list, and then have another worker that's pulling out 100 of those at a time and bulk inserting. So, um, but yeah, having that queue is really useful because you can control the concurrency. Controlling the concurrency is really useful because having crazy concurrency is one of the easiest ways to break your Elasticsearch server. Follow-up question, Follow question. That when you're doing the uh, bulk imports, uh, do you know of a sweet spot or what, how would you recommend kind of uh, gearing things towards the number of documents you do in a single bulk, bulk import? So yeah, how do you, is there a recommendation for how many documents to do in a bulk import? Um, there is no specific recommendation on that because it's going to vary based on what's in your documents, how much data is in there, how complex the analysis is. It's really something you just have to benchmark. Um, I recommend shooting for something that completes in like a second or less. Some people might shovel a thousand documents or 10,000 documents per update and just let the update run for 10 seconds or more. But I think it makes a little more sense to have slightly smaller updates. Um, so I don't know, anywhere between 100 or 1,000 documents, um, really anything that takes between 100 milliseconds and a second to crunch through and make it work. I'd rather have you know, um, 10 updates in 10 seconds than one update that takes 10 seconds, if that makes sense. Awesome, thank you. And I'd rather have either of those than 10 updates per second, in which case you're not gonna be doing that for very long, maybe, anyway. More shards is helpful too if you can't really like make that. So I've got a I've got a client that's ingesting like a million documents a minute, and they've got like twenty shards and some Spark job that's chucking data at Elasticsearch. It's pretty awesome. Um, yeah. Come on, guys, stun me. <laughs> Should 
Should we talk about why Postgres is awesome? Because <laughs> it is. I use Postgres. I love Postgres. All right, well, um, thanks, everyone. Might have to do part two at some point to do the analytics side that I didn't get around to, because that's pretty sweet stuff, too. But another time. <laughs> So thanks, Nick, and thanks, Caleb. I actually did think of one announcement that I wanted to make that I forgot earlier. Um, I think we're still looking for a beginner talk for next month. We already have an advanced talk. Oh, well, Caleb wants me to mention Keeper Be Weird. If you know anybody that wants to spot on, you can talk to him at uh, uh, B.E. Riley's. So yeah, thanks, um, Capital Factory. Um, Anthony, you got anything else you want to say about next month? Cool, well, yeah, we're done, like I said, a little bit early. So head on down to B.E. Riley's. Thank you to Hired. Um, and then I assume Amanda's already down there getting that set up. So, um, if you rather just straight down Brazos towards 6th, take a left right there. Goodbye, friends. <laughs>